Okay, I want to make sure that my PowerPoint is now showing full screen. Is it? It is for me. If you guys can give me thumbs up in the chat. Roy did. That would be you. helpful. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we're going to go into kind of what we're doing today. So the what this is, is to try and make sure that the volunteers who are going to help us out with helping people file their tax returns are comfortable with what they're doing. Um, and so most of what you're going to be doing is going to be filing um, tax appeals with people online. Um, you know, people who aren't as comfortable with the online process or just not as comfortable with the tax appeal process, you're going to be really helpful to, to get them over that hurdle and get the thing filed. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go through things, not necessarily in a logical way, but kind of in the, the more important things first. So we'll start with talking about submitting an online tax appeal. This is going to be just the basics of file, filling out the form and filing it online. Um, part two, we'll talk about researching values. It's going to dig into how to research and assert a value. Um, but, you know, spoiler alert, we're actually going to have some pre-research done. So the people who are registered for the sessions, we will hopefully have a um, you know, a set of values that you can use to, to work with them to figure out what the value should be. So not, this part should not scare you. It's just to give you the background on what it is you're going to be looking at so that when the clients ask you about it, you'll have, you know, that information as well. And then part three is kind of the hodgepodge. Oops. It's kind of a hodgepodge of the other things that I think the client might need to know um, that, you know, just in the flurry of getting this thing done, I, I just sort of lumped them all down at the end. So, um, so again, my plan is to get the most important things up first and then work through the other things that, that you'll be helping the clients kind of understand. Okay, before we get into that though, I want you to, to understand what it is we're gonna be looking at. So this is the notice of assessment. This is what the clients have all gotten. Um, they went out on um, June 9th and um, hopefully everyone got it in the mail. Um, Although this was the first year that they did the um, electronic, uh, you know, dis distribution of the notice of assessment, even though people signed up for it like two or three years ago, and so I think there are a lot of people who didn't realize <laughs> that's what this was. Actually, uh, our former executive director sent me an email saying, "I think this is spam," and um, it turned out it was that they were sending him his notice of assessment, and he didn't get it by mail. So if you talk to anybody who didn't get it by mail, they, that may be the reason. Um, but whether you got it by mail or not, the deadline is going to be on July 24th. So the, the notice of assessment does have that notice date and the deadline. Um, and we'll talk about how to find this if the client doesn't have it. Some things that you're going to be looking at and talking with the client about whether or not to appeal are going to be what it has for homestead exemption. Uh, if they have applied for homestead exemption and it's showing no, then they're probably going to need to appeal that denial. Um, it's possible they're still processing it, but to be on the safe side, they want to appeal it. If it says yes, and it just says HFO1, do they apply for something more than the basic exemption? Again, they're going to want to appeal it. If it says HF something else, it may or may not be <laughs> the senior exemptions or whatever that they've applied for. Um, and so for that, they may want to check with the assessor's office before deciding whether or not they need to appeal that. But that's going to be one of the things we want to look at to see if they, they do need to file an appeal. The big one, of course, is the value. Um, so this on the notice of assessment is going to give last year's value and this year's value, and it's going to give both the 100% and the 40%. The 40% is what they actually tax on, um, but the 100% is really what we're going to be focusing on. Um, and if there's a big jump, then they want to think about appealing that. Um, and that they may want to think about appealing that just by, on the basis of if they appeal it and see it through to the Board of Equalization, they get a three-year freeze. And so it's not going to go up for the next two years. And that alone can be, you know, helpful. Um, but, you know, certainly if it's a big jump, then they may want to um, consider appealing, especially if it affects this down here. So the, the bottom of the form is the estimated tax. And what they do is because the counties and cities and schools are all in the process of creating the millage rate for this year. They use last year's millage rates and millage rates are just the tax rate. So they use last year's rates with the new value to give you an estimate of what the value, what the taxes are gonna be. And the, um, 
important thing on this is that, you know, if there's not a big increase in the taxes, they may not want to appeal. But that may not be the, the last thing you want to ask them about it because I, you know, I actually picked this notice of assessment just randomly and I was very happy <laughs> when I did because this is actually one that the person is getting senior exemptions and she is just about to go over the threshold to start having to pay school taxes. She's in the city of Atlanta. City of Atlanta, the highest senior exemption is going to be seventy-five thousand um, dollars for the forty percent assessed value. And you can see that this will put her at seventy-three thousand. So that means that you know within the next year or two, she is going to go above that threshold. So it may be worth appealing just to keep from getting to that point where you start paying the school taxes or to slow down the school tax increases. Because that, that's where you can really see a big jump in the, um, the taxes because there's no uh, floating exemption on the city of Atlanta school taxes and also not on most bonds. So. Sorry, Stacey, someone asked about last year's millage rate. I'm not quite sure I understand the question though, Taryn. Um, when Stacey talks about millage rates, they're, they're different according to these certain taxing authorities. Um, so I don't know what millage rate would have been 1.25. Okay, I was asking in reference, I know Stacy, you said the millage rate is going to increase. So I was wondering what was the millage rate for 2022? They're not necessarily going to increase. The, the millage rate is what's, the millage rate for 2022 is what is currently on the notice of assessment. So, um, and or you can look at the tax bill from last year and that, that'll show you the millage rate. The millage rate is just your tax rate, and each each taxing authority has its own millage rate. Um, okay, so so on this document that you're showing us, can you show us where we would find the millage rate? Down here, um, where it's you know, so I've got the estimated tax. Yes. It points down to uh, to the bottom, but right. it's the the second column from the the right. Yeah, I see it. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, so it gives the individual millage rates. And you can see, if you look at that, again, the, the school tax millage rate is so much higher than the others. It's 0 0.02 versus 0 0.00 something. So it's, and, and I just, I, I want to be clear, I'm following protocol. Is it okay to um, just to type the questions in the chat and then you guys address them as we go or should we save our questions for the end? It's fine to do either way. Carrie is going to, alert me when there are questions that she needs to interrupt me for and then um, she kind of knows what I talk about so she probably some of them she may defer to you know once I cover it later um, or she may just answer <laughs> but I don't I can't I can't multitask so I can't do the chat and this but Carrie will take care of me yeah I'm happy to you can put questions in the chat and if we don't get to them in the main section then we'll come back to them at the end and also allow time at the end to, um, you know, if, if other questions occur to you, then I'll be happy to answer them. And I, I probably should have said this up front. I will be there for every one of the consultation sessions. Carrie will be available. Uh, Mary will be there. We'll have plenty of people who are really, you know, well versed in this stuff to be there to answer questions, um, you know, when you're in the thick of it. So this, you know, this will give you a good background. So don't feel like you have to know everything, you know, backwards and forwards. Okay. So this is that's the notice of assessment. Um, the clients may be bringing them in with them. If they don't have them with them, then they um, you can look them up online. There's a couple other pieces that are going to be important for um, you know, some of the other pieces of the research, or um, you. Know, preparing the appeal. So I just want to highlight the property ID number is on this document as is the neighborhood code. Um, and each, each property is in a neighborhood that's been subdivided in a way that may not be the same as what you think of as your neighborhood. So that code is important, um, but we'll get into that a little bit more later on. I just want to show you where these are on the document. The other preliminary thing I want to run through is there are three grounds for appeal that we'll be talking about. Um, one is uniformity. That is basically a fairness argument that um, the taxing authorities are supposed to tax uniformly. Um, and this doesn't mean that everyone pays the exact same amount in taxes, but it means that the values that they're putting on the properties 
should be pretty uniform. And so if they're if they're putting a value on similar homes that are less than what it is for the client, then that's not really fair. And so they, um, you know, they can argue that you know they should be getting a lower value just based on the uniformity of the values of the other properties. And these are going to be the values that the assessor says the house is worth. So it'll be the 2023 values that came on their notices of assessment. The second grounds for appeal is value, which is a little confusing because both of these I think of as value appeals, but um, there are different arguments. There's a uniformity argument and then there's a value argument. And the value argument then gets subdivided into two more arguments. Um, one is condition. So the condition of the home is um, if it doesn't meet what's in the assessor's records, then that's a good reason for a lower value. And that's going to be a really common thing with a lot of our clients that um, are, that we see. You know, the, the assessors, when they're doing these assessments, it's basically a computer program that goes through and does it. And then they do a little bit of sort of checking through it. But mostly that's, you know, at most that's going to be a drive-by. They're not generally going to come and go into somebody's home. And so they have no idea what the condition of the home is. And so this is where you can get a pretty dramatic difference between what they say the house condition is and what you say it is. Um, and so that can be a good argument for a lower value. The other one is sales. And this is a harder one <laughs> because um, basically this is gonna be looking at sales of homes in that neighborhood code in the prior year. So they're trying to set the values as of January 1st which means that any of the sales that happened after January 1st are counting for next year. So you're gonna to wanna to, um, think about the sales from last year to figure out what the house should be worth this year. And really they're using those just as a guide to try and guess what the client's house would sell for because the client's house probably didn't sell last year. Um, if they sold last year, then they can argue for that sale value. Um, but anyway, so those are the two main value appeals. And then the third grounds for appeal is the exemption denied. And so this is, you know, they applied for the Hempstead exemption before the deadline, which this year was April 3rd, and they did not get it. Um, so if, you know, if they got denied the exemption or if they just haven't gotten approved yet, then it's worth going ahead and appealing it. One thing that's a little different this year is that we can't appeal all three of these in one appeal. Well, you can, but you, you have to do it in a, a paper appeal. Um, you can't do it online. And they actually have done it now where you can't even do separate appeals online for uniformity of value uh, versus and then a second one for exemption denied. You actually have to do one of them as a paper appeal, which is really annoying. But hopefully that means that they will actually process them correctly if we do it that way. Anyway, so those are the three grounds for appeal. And those are the things that, you know, when you're talking with the client, you'll be thinking about, you know, which of these should they be checking and, um, you know, or should they be checking all three of them? Okay, so now we're gonna get into the, the main thrust of what y'all are gonna be doing. It's gonna be submitting the appeal. The first thing you wanna make sure they under, the, everyone understands is the deadline for submitting these appeals is gonna be July 24th. There is no extension beyond that. There's no good cause to appeal late. Um, there is a small group of people that are gonna be getting another um, notice of assessment and they'll get a little bit of extra time, but you shouldn't count on it. You know, they, they need to appeal it by July 24th. And when I say they need to appeal by July 24th, it needs to be either you know, submitted online, delivered in person, or postmarked on or before July 24th. And they need to have proof of whatever way they're doing it to, to prove that they actually did do it on time. If they didn't do it on time, then they've lost the right to appeal. And the key to this is the tax bill is not coming out before July 24th. So they have to um, appeal it before that tax bill comes out. And tax bill is usually when they're like, wait, wait, why didn't I appeal? So, so they need to be sure they get it in. Now, the people that you'll be seeing have all decided that they, they realize they need to appeal it. They still need to understand what the deadline is. So if you don't actually submit it with them, they need to know that they need to get it in on or before July 24th. So this is what the paper form looks like. 
this is actually the paper form from last year and the one from this year actually looks exactly the same, except instead of saying 2022, it actually doesn't have a year at all. <laughs> so um, I probably should have used that one, but, um, but I didn't. So most of what you're going to be doing is going to be online appeals, but it's still going to be basically the exact same information that you see here on the paper form. Um, and so some of the, the well, all the highlighted information that's on here um, is stuff that really should be filled in. And um, in the online form, it's either going to be, you know, auto-populated or, um, you know, just an easy fill in the blank um, in the paper form. Of course, you have to look and try and find where, where you need to fill out the stuff. The key things are the owner's name, the address, contact information, the parcel ID number. So again, that was what was on the notice of assessment that may not be you know, something that people readily know. Um, what the grounds for appeal are and the owner's opinion of value, which is going to be another piece of, you know, the hard part of what y'all are going to be doing. Um, so because this is very similar to the online form, I'm just going to hit some of the highlights. For the um, grounds of appeal, again, there are three grounds for appeal, the value, uniformity, and exemption denied. You want to check every one of those that applies. So especially on the paper form, you can do all three of them. Um, so you know, if they want to do a paper form and they, they have been denied the exemption, you can hit all three of those. Um, or, you know, if you're just doing value or just doing uniformity or just doing homestead exemption, you can do one or two, you know, it's basically whichever ones apply, those are the ones that you need to check. We suggest going with the Board of Equalization. Um, and the reason for that is it's free and they hear all of the, um, you know, homeowner residential um, tax appeals. And it's, it's generally kind of an easier way of going than doing the um, hearing officer or arbitration. And so, and the Board of Equalization is basically just three taxpayers who have been selected to hear the cases. They get a little bit of training, but for the most part, they're just taxpayers like the people sitting across from them. And it's basically just those three people listening to the homeowner, and the appraiser from the assessor's office. And that's it. It's, there are no like formal rules of evidence. It's very informal, um, not nearly as scary as a lot of people think. Um, and so that's why the Board of Equalization is just sort of an easy way for people to, to do this pro se. Um, we recommend that they select the 85% for billing preference. What that means is that when they get the tax bill, because the tax bill is going to come out while the appeal is pending, and they're going to need to pay that tax bill. It's going to be a temporary tax bill, and they need to pay it. And if they select 85%, then that tax bill is going to be either last year's value or the 85% of the notice of assessment value, if that's less than last year's value. But for the most part, it's going to be last year's value which means that their tax bill is gonna be probably pretty similar to last year's tax, um, tax bill. So, you know, hopefully they can, you know, are already prepared to be able to pay that. And then doing the 85% the means that they can also save money until this whole process is done and hopefully have enough money for whatever the final tax bill is gonna be. Because usually the value is gonna be at least a little bit higher than what last year's value was. And that means that the, the final bill will usually have a little bit more that's owed than what they paid in their temporary bill. So, you know, make sure the person knows that they need to be saving some money to, to be ready for that final bill. Finally, the owner's opinion of value. This is going to be where the person says what they think the value should be. Um, you know, I don't think that your value is right. What I think it should be is this. And this is often the hardest part. And so this is where when we get into the research piece of it, I'll, I'll explain how we come up with some suggestions for what that value should be. But ultimately, you know, the person can put down whatever they want. Um, at this stage, it's not written in stone. You can put in a value now and argue a completely different value at the Board of Equalization. You can go higher, you can go lower, whatever, you know, once it gets to that point, whatever you feel like you can justify, then you can argue that. Um, but this is what you want at this stage 
generally is to do sort of a low ball of the value because there's a 180 day rule that if they don't process the uh, appeal within 180 days, then um, the whatever value you put down, that's what you get. And so, you know, if it's low, then that's great. Um, you know, if you were planning to argue for a lower value at the Board of Equalization, it's not so great. So, um, so it's, you know, it's better to have a low ball at this stage. The other thing a low ball will do is it makes it more likely that you end up getting to the Board of Equalization. And getting to the Board of Equalization means that, that you'll get that freeze as long as you, you know, make an appearance and or present evidence for the Board of Equalization, then you get the freeze, whatever the outcome is. Um, whereas if they just agree to a different value, they may or may not agree to the freeze. So, um, so, anyway, so low balling it is kind of no harm at this stage and can have some advantages. Okay, so doing the online appeals. So you're going to go to FultonAssessor.org. That's the, the main Fulton Assessor's website. You're going to look for appeals and click on property appeal, and that's gonna bring up this property appeals page. On this page, you'll find the online process for appeal, as well as a link for the PDF for the um, paper form. But of course, the online process is, is the main one that y'all are gonna be doing. That'll take you to this page, the online services. You'll click on the link to access their online portal, um, their smart file system, and that's gonna bring you here. If the client already has a login, and some of them do, some of them have filed for homestead exemptions before, or they filed um, tax appeals before. So some of them may have already dealt with the system. So that if they have done that, then they can log in using their email and the, the password they already have. If they set up a system, uh, um, account, but have forgotten the password, the forgot password makes it really easy just to reset the password. The harder ones are going to be the clients who don't have an account. Um, they do need to have an email account that they can access to be able to set up the account. But uh, if they have that, then it's pretty easy for you to walk them through what they need to do. So basically, they'll click on the create a new account. It'll take them to a registration page where they put in their email address and then make up whatever password they want and then click register. That's going to generate an email to their email account and take you to a screen that says, check your email. And then, um, so they need to go to their email account, click on a link, and that'll activate the account. At that point, it'll actually show up as a screen that says, click here to, to log into your account. You can do that you know, if you're using your computer to, to help them set it up, then the, you, know, you just click there and keep going. Or if they're doing it like on their phone or something like that, and you want to use your computer, then you just go back to the login page and do the login using their um, new you know, email address and, and password. And that'll log you into the system. Once you log in, it's going to automatically take you to available filings. And you're going to look for the property tax appeal. And it's the second one, appeals, residential and commercial real property. It is real property. I was talking to a client just the other day that had clicked personal property because it was her personal property. Um, but, you know, my legal mind is like, no, personal property is different. But um, anyway, so, um, so you want to do the appeals, residential and commercial real property. That'll take you to the beginning of filing the online appeal. You click begin filing. This is one of those that like, they could make it a lot easier to search for the property, but they only accept the parcel ID number here. And so that's why, again, on the um, notes of assessment, I pointed out where you find it. And so you can either, you know, if they have the notice of ass assessment, you can type it in. If they don't, you can actually look it up um, in the Fulton Assessor property search, which I'll get into in a little bit. And so you'll put in the property, the parcel ID number, hit search, and it'll actually try and look up the property. And so it should it should list the property down here. And once it does that, then you're gonna click on start filing. And then you're really gonna get started on the, um, the property tax appeal form. 
And again, some of the stuff is going to be pre, you know, pre filled out. And so you'll just sort of confirm the information in there is correct, um, but there's you can't change it. Um, and so you'll just be kind of, you know, you'll hit next and you'll work your way through the different pages of this whole form. I'm going to hit some of the highlights of this because there, there are a few places where it gets a little confusing. But for the most part, it's, you know, very straightforward and just, you know, you'll fly through it. Does the um, information auto-populate when you enter your personal ID info? Yeah, so um, let me go back. When you enter the parcel ID number, it'll come up with search results down here, um, you know, down at the bottom. And then um, assuming that that actually is your property or the client's property, then you click on start filing. If it doesn't come up as, as their property, then you're going to need to try the parcel ID number again. And then we'll troubleshoot if that still doesn't work. Um, but it should come up with the property right then. And then once it's selected the, that parcel ID number, that's how it's pulling all the other information. So it's going to pull up that parcel ID number. It's going to pull up that owner's name, that like, the you know address for that parcel. It'll auto automatically populate those things. Click next. Work through the pages. So the. Once you verify the, the parcel, it then goes to the filer. And this is one of those that, you know, you're helping somebody else. So there are people that, that, so you might think that you're an agent, you're not. You're basically helping them do it themselves. And so you just need to confirm that you're acting on behalf of the owner and, um, and click owner. Do not click agent. We are not the agents for the people we're helping. We're not, you know, doing any ongoing um, representation. And in the online system, you actually have to be pre-registered as an agent before you can uh, file that. There's a hand raised. Hi there, um, which is exactly what I have a little bit of um, uh, concern about uh, knocking on neighbors' doors to encourage them you know, to go ahead and appeal if they're having issues you know, with their um, their property tax. And so I do know that they are they were pretty friendly when I went down just to make a physical um to fill out the form physically. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of good information in doing that process. I don't know how busy they are now. I went a few weeks ago. But um Will the spill be as we're trying to encourage our neighbors to, you know, go ahead and do this process? Would the spill be if if you can't make it down there physically? Here, here's a way to go ahead and take care of it. If you can't make it down there physically, we might be able to help, um, you know, you with the online process if you feel comfortable with it. Uh, it's kind of what I was just thinking as you were were saying that. Yeah, and that's um, I. We're, our first consultation sessions are actually virtual, so we won't actually be sitting face to face with the person. Oh, okay. Um, and and basically, what we'll just what you need to do is just you know make sure you're communicating with the with the person about you know I'm not representing you in this. I'm helping you to do this for yourself. Okay, and so I'm sorry. Maybe that's coming down the line with your explanation on you know what those steps would be because I'm not necessarily knowing how it would work virtually. Uh, for us to help so yeah on the virtual ones basically we'll be using zoom and so it'll be sort of sharing the screen to be able to walk through the doc the different pages in the same way you would by just you know turning the computer so that people could see it when you're face to face okay i got you all right yeah. thank, thank you sure okay so the next thing is it again you verify information there's a couple places where you enter stuff like you know even though you used a, an email to set up the account it asks again for the owner's email just i think to confirm that it's you know the um any email communication with the owner that they want to make sure that they have that email address um and the phone number they want to have those up to date but then the other stuff is going to auto populate this is the one, the, the kind of key one. And this is, we went over a lot of this with the pay, talking about the paper form. This is where you get all those questions. So it's gonna ask you the grounds to appeal. Now, one thing 
that's a little tricky on this is that the when you get to this page, instead of having all of the grounds for appeal showing, it's only going to show the homestead exemption denied. In order to get to the value appeals, you have to say, no, you're not appealing the homestead exemption denied. And this is, again, going back to they, they won't let you do all of it together online. Um, and so if they're doing if they're doing both, they have to decide which one they want to do online, um, you know, or if they want to do any of it online, and and you know answer the that question accordingly. If they want to do the homestead exemption denial online, that that appeal online, then they'll say yes, and it won't even ever ask about the value um, appeal uh, grounds. If they say no, then then it's going to come up and say, "Hey, do you want to, uh, you know, appeal the value and the uniformity?" And then it also has taxability, which is different from homestead exemption denied. Um, taxability is that that you shouldn't even be taxing my home, um, and so that you know that doesn't apply to most most people. So the um, the main three that people are going to select is going to be homestead exemption denied which will keep them from doing the value ones online. Or if they say no to that, then um, the value and uniformity. Um, again, we suggest that they choose the Board of Equalization as which one they want for the appeal process. This is where they're gonna need to put in the owner's opinion of value on the online appeal. Um, and so this is where you're gonna have a discussion about like, what, what value should we put here. and um, you'll have some research available to be able to help you with figuring that out. On the um, on this form, you actually have to decide if you're doing the 85 or the 100%. So you have to select one of those in order to complete the, the application or the, the appeal. Um, and so again, 85% allows them to basically pay kind of what they paid last year and then be saving in case it's more than, um, than what the temporary tax bill is. So this is where the bulk of the work goes. Again, if they're going to file a homestead exemption denial appeal, as well as some sort of value appeal, value and or uniformity, those need to be filed separately. One of them is going to need to be filed by um, paper. I'm happy to, to help with figuring out what, what you need to do on that, in those cases. But, um, but make sure the person knows that they, they, they do need to have separate appeals for those. And Stacy, the paper one, if they just want to file a paper form, they could do all, all of them three. on paper, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I thought. Um, yeah, I, I need to, double to absolutely confirm that, but I, they, they have processed the paper ones correctly in the past. So I think they're fine with that, which is why I don't understand why they can't do it in the electronic version. But um, they're like, well, different offices process them. Well, still different offices are processing the piece of paper, but okay. Um, but yeah, so if, if the person wants to do all three on paper, that's fine. I will say that the downside of doing a paper appeal is that um, there, like I said, there's no automatic proof that you filed it unless you asked for it. So, you know, if you take it in in person, you need to get something, you have some sort of receipt showing you so you filed it. If you're going to mail it in, you need to be sure that you're mailing it in a way that they can confirm that it was mailed on time and actually received. So, you know, it's just, it's not as easy to prove as the online version. And you don't have the ability to go back and look at it the way you do on the online version. Okay, so this is the next one that's a little bit confusing. Um, this is where you can put the reasons that you think the value should be lower or that they should be able to get the exemption that they were denied. Um, you don't have to put anything here. It does not have to be filled in, but you know, just some at least some generic statement is usually helpful just to say, you know, I I think that my value should be lower because it, you know, these. You know, these three houses in my neighborhood are valued lower and therefore our mine should be lower as well. Um, or even just the generic, I think my house should be lower because other houses in my neighborhood justify a lower value. So it doesn't have to be anything fancy, just you know, something to say, this is why I think it should be lower. If you don't put anything there, that's fine. 
Um, you can just hit next. This is not a required field. Attachments, you can upload supporting documents. And this is one of those that, you know, when we first started this project, we were telling people like, oh yeah, if you can, if you can up upload any evidence, then you should upload it. At this point, I don't even think we should because Colton does not provide the uploaded evidence to the Board of Equalization. So you're going to have to submit it later to the Board of Equalization. Um, so if you want to submit it ahead of time to the Board of Assessors, that's fine, but, uh, but it's certainly not necessary. So if you have, if the client does have some documents and they really do want to upload it, but they're, they're not able to do it right then, then you need to make sure that they know that they need to come back and upload those documents and hit submit before the, the end of the day on the 24th. Because um, if they don't hit that submit button by the deadline, it's not submitted. So, um, and again, there's nothing that requires them to do this. So if they don't really care if they have any documents uploaded, you can go ahead and submit even without anything. And if they, um, do have any evidence they want to show, they need to hold it and, and show it to the Board of Equalization because that's that's really where they're going to need to be able to show their evidence to justify a lower value. The submit button, um, you don't want to hit submit unless the appeal really is complete. If, they, if there's anything that they want to come back and add, then you shouldn't hit submit. They should come back. They can, they can log back in and go to my filings and they can find the um, the draft app, um, appeal in there. So they can come back to it and, and finish it and hit submit on their own. Um, but ideally you wanna be able to get to that point where it's done. Um, and at this point you can print a draft of the appeal, um, but it's not, they, they, you'll get another chance to, to print a final version of it after you hit the submit. So I tend to wait until then. But if, it, so if they are ready to hit submit, then it's going to confirm. Do you really mean that you, you when you hit that submit, do you really mean it? Um, and so you'll hit yes again, and you'll get a confirmation page. And so if you do not get this confirmation page, you have not hit submit. You, the the um, appeal has not been submitted. They need to see this app, um, confirmation page. It has a filing ID. Like I said, it's got a print button where you can print the, um, the filing. So like you, know, you can print it as a PDF and, and share it with them. Um, so if you get this confirmation page, yay, you, you've succeeded. Um, the other thing that you'll see is up here at the top, um, Message Center already has one message. That message is going to be the, the automatic thing saying your, um, your appeal was submitted. And so it'll give you a confirmation message with a date to, again, confirm that that, app, that appeal was filed on time. That message should also be sent to the email that's on, um, on the account. So the person should go and check to see if that's going into their spam folder so that they can correct that now. Um, so they, they can come back and check for messages, but it's easier, obviously, if any messages go to their, spam, go to their regular inbox instead of their spam folder. They can also go back to my filings to look at the um, the appeal later. Um, they could even you know print the appeal later. Um, so that's sort of helpful to be able to show you know on down the line when they're trying to remember like what did I do? Why did I appeal this? It's handy to be able to come log back in and and see it. Um, so if they're going to do the paper appeal. What I suggest is, you know, make a copy of whatever it is they're submitting so that they still have that ability to go back and look at what it was they, they submitted. So again, online is, is what we recommend. Um, you want them to save the confirmation page so that they have proof that they filed it and that it has the filing number on there to be able to track it down if it gets lost. Um, they can do a paper appeal by mail. Um, we definitely recommend that it be mailed certified with return receipt requested so that it, you can prove when it was mailed and that it was received because it needs to be postmarked on or before July 24th. Um, and so even delivering it to the post office on July 24th is not going to guarantee that postmark. So, but if you get it certified, then you have the little receipt showing that this was the date that you filed it. 
you can also file in person by just bringing the paper form um, to either the, the main address for the assessor's office or to any of the annexes. So th this is a list of all the, the offices where you can file in person. Um, again, the, the it has to be filed by the deadline. The deadline this year is July 24. The sort of next things that the client can expect after they've submitted their, their appeal is that it's going to be processed by the Board of Assessors. And they're not going to finish processing them before the bills come out. So they're going to, so the um, person needs to understand they are going to get a temporary tax bill. It's going to be, you know, hopefully the 85%. They're going to need to pay it and they need to save to in case the final result is going to be um, higher than that. The first step, even though they've selected Board of Equalization for how they want the bill process, the first step is actually the Board of Assessors get a second bite at it. And so that's the part that they have to decide within 180 days whether they're going to um, do a change or no change. So they can change the value that they think it is. And if they change it, then they're going to send what looks like another notice of assessment. And the person only has 30 days from the date on that one to be able to file the appeal. And then that one has to be appealed um, by paper. There's no online appeal for that. Um, and so they need to act quickly. Uh, because of that may not get them the freeze. Um, you know, if they like that value, then they can talk with the assessor and see if if they can get that freeze. But it may is not guaranteed. If you if they show up for the board of equalization, they're going to get that freeze, um, and they can always appeal to the board of equalization and then agree to that at value later. But um, but they want to be sure that they they're getting the freeze. If there's no change, which means that the assessor's office decides they're going to stick with the value that the um, the notice of assessment has, there then they'll send a no change letter, which basically just says there's no change, and we're we're forwarding this on to the board of equalization. And it's a kind of a confusing notice, but that's what it means. It means that you don't need to do anything. We're sending it on to the board of equalization, and ultimately the board of equalization will decide what the value should be. Those hearings will go on until next year. Um, some of them will be scheduled pretty quickly. They'll probably start hearing cases at least by August. So some will happen quickly, but most of them will just keep going. And so they're still working on the appeals from last year now. Um, their goal is always to try and get them done by June, but at least for the last several years, they've not done that, um, depending on the number of appeals and, you know, little tweaks to the process, they may get them done this year before June, but uh, but who knows. The important thing to remember is that this may not be resolved until sometime next year, which again is why it's important to be saving for the tax bill. Because I've seen some where they get the final bill at the same time they're getting next year's tax bill. <laughs> and so that can be really stressful to, to have to um, pay, you know, kind of two tax bills at the same time. Okay, this is, I've mentioned the 180 day rule. Basically the Board of Assessors has 180 days to do that change or no change. This isn't 180 days to get through the Board of Equalization, it's just for the Board of Assessor piece of it. But the, the examples, let's say that someone who filed their appeal on July 1st and they asserted a value of 58,000. The assessors have to make that change or no change decision by December 28th to be able to meet that 180 days. Now there is an exception for counties where more than 3% of the county digest gets appealed, which is usually what happens in Fulton County. Uh, but in order for them to be able to extend that 180 days, they actually have to send a notice at least 30 days before the end of the 180 days to let people know that they're doing that. And so if the person hasn't received anything saying they're extending it by November 28th, then it's still a, a violation of the 180 day rule. If they don't get a, um, get the change or no change done before December 28th. If they violate the 180 day rule, then whatever value was asserted is what has to be accepted. And you can push the assessor's office to accept that value. And so um, essentially you win without having to do anything else. So that's why that's important. 
um, they're getting much better. They, they actually, when we first started this, there were a number of people that had the 180 day rule when um, now it seems the only ones that I've seen have that are the ones where they had problems processing the, the online appeals when they did two appeals. Um, but which again is why they're not allowing them. Um, it, it, it's just they're not getting as many appeals as they they did back in like 2018, and they're they're working on improving their processes. So it, 180 day rules are not it, they don't violate it that often, but occasionally they do, and so it's worth knowing. Okay, so that's the bulk of what you're going to be doing. I'm going to talk now about doing the research, um, and this is going to kind of go through how the research is done. But again, spoiler, we're going to have some free research done for y'all for these. Um, and so that's going to make it easier. Now, if there's a walk in, then, you know, and we have time to take them, then those are ones where we're not going to necessarily have this done. But, um, you know, for the most part, what you're going to be doing is just looking at the end result. Um, so, where do you go? You go to the FultonAssessor.org website, and they now have um, they now have two property search options, which is absolutely wonderful. I you know they initially had taken away the one from last year, and there were parts of that that I was really upset about. Um, but they added the enhanced property search, which is just phenomenal. Um, so. You can use either of these to look up the, the client's property. I recommend doing the enhanced property search because it tends to be more user-friendly. Um, there are a couple of things that the basic property search is gonna be better for. And so I'll touch on those after we go through the enhanced property search. Um, but the enhanced property search is amazing. Okay, so you click on enhanced property search, that's gonna take you to this. And this is what, what I think of as QPublic because QPublic is the, the company that or the brand or whatever for the website. Um, when you go there, you're gonna choose a search method. And so instead of having to do the parcel ID number, you have the option of using the owner's name or the, the um, property address. And this website will actually work on trying to guess what it is you're asking for while you're typing. Um, and so it can help you make sure that you, you get it the way that the county has the information as opposed to the old, the, the basic property search, you had to make sure that you had exactly what they had in their system to be able to pull it up. So I you know, a street name Magruder is MC space G. Um, and so you may not know that in, in their system. With this one, it'll sort of start guessing what it is you're trying to get and makes it a lot easier. So you put in you know, the name or the address or whatever and um, hit search and pull up the client's property. And with that, it's actually gonna be all just in one long sheet. Um, all the property information is all just in one place. And so you just scroll down and just look for it. Um, and this is kind of the, the highlighted piece of like, it's the main things that you're going to be looking at. It's the main information about the client's home. And so you're going to look through it, make sure that everything is accurate. If it's, you know, like if it says a square footage that's more than what the person has, that's something to appeal on. Also, if the property, you know, if the, the land square footage is um, bigger than what the client actually has, that's a, something to appeal on. Um, Another thing you can look at is the sort of history of values. This isn't as important on our client's property because we're already looking at there was an increase from 2022 to 2023, um, or there's a reason why they're, they're appealing it. Um, but where this could come in handy is, and, and the one flaw with the enhanced, um, enhanced property search is that it does not have anything to show when a property has been appealed. And so if a property, if you're looking at a comp that you're trying to say, this is, this justifies a lower value for my client's home, but it, the value you're looking at is the, the frozen value, they're going to discount that. They're going to say that that's not really a 2023 value. That's really, you know, the 2022 or 2021 value from the appeal. Um, and so 
unfortunately, this system doesn't show you the appeals. Um, and so that's why I'll show you the basic property search to kind of give you that too. Um, but if the values are all the same, then th there's a good chance that it's because there was an appeal. Um, so like if this year and last year are the same, or if this year and the last two years are the same, then it's, it's probably an appeal. But anyway, so you'll scroll down to see all the information about the property, go through it with the client, see if any of it's um, like problematic, that you want to do a value appeal based on the, uh, the condition of the property. And then keep scrolling down. Um, so if the client doesn't have the notice of assessment, if you scroll on down, you'll find it. The, you just hit this button and um, it'll you know, download the, um, the notice of assessment. It's, it's a easier um, way of getting it than with the, the old basic uh, property search. But the true enhancement of the enhanced property search um, whole system is this. This little button is amazing. Um, for doing you know, your research to try and find comps, you hit a button, uh, you, know, you, you hit this button and boom, it comes up with this search page. And you can see in that right-hand uh, column, that's all the client's you know, property information. I should say, this is just some random person that I picked, but um, it, it's all their property information. And it's going to automatically tick some of the main things that, that you would normally search for. So you can customize your search using any of these categories, and it automatically ticks the neighborhood code. So again, you're going to be comparing your client's home to other homes in that same neighborhood. And it's not necessarily the neighborhood that we traditionally think of as the neighborhood. It's you know whatever their neighborhood code is. And so this will automatically narrow it to that neighborhood code. It also picks the class, which, you know, whatever, the residential. Um, and then it, it automatically ticks the sales data. So now, if you're doing a uniformity search, you're just going to unclick that. Um, but if you're doing the sales search, it's already there. And uh, the only thing you really have to do to change anything for a sales search is I would suggest switching from one year to putting in the, the actual dates for, uh, for 2022 so that you get the entire year of 2022 instead of you know the last six months of this year and the first six or the last six months of last year or whatever. Um, but with that, that's the only change you have to do to do a, a sales research. You can you know narrow it with the other things, but you don't have to. This system will actually let you um, look at as many as you want. Um, and so once you've select, you know filled out your search criteria. You click search and it's going to come up with the list. And the first thing at the top is going to be um, the, the client's address. And then there's a whole list of um, sales in the that person's neighborhood from 2022. And, and you can work from this list if you want to. Um, I recommend downloading it and I'll get to that one in a, that in a minute. Because the other really fun thing of this system is this. Um, this isn't really going to apply to what y'all are doing, but um, but it may come in handy for the clients. Um, once you've selected a number of um, of comps, as long as it's less than five, you you just go through and select them in in this list, and then click that button, and that button will cause it to um, create a packet that is basically an exhibit for the hearing. Um, but that that will pack it will give you the um, a chart with all of the properties compared to the subject property. And then um, it will also include the property information for each of those properties so that you have all of it right there in just one handy packet. It's amazing. But for what we're doing, we're actually um, you know kind of at the beginning stages of trying to figure out what comps to use. So what we do, what I do is I scroll down until I get to the bottom of the list. And down at the bottom of the list, you, there's a, um, a button for downloading. And it defaults to downloading it for Excel. You could also do it as CSV, but you click on download and it downloads the entire list. It's amazing. And it gives you all sorts of information about the properties that can come in really handy. So when you hit that download, 
and open it in Excel, this is basically what you get. Um, it's just a whole huge list. I've formatted it a little bit to be able to fit it onto this page. And the, the you know, client's property is the first line. So the first thing I do is I highlight it. So that, that yellow line is because I highlighted it. But then like all the other information about the properties are there. This is gonna be really handy to, to be able to, to narrow down what properties we wanna look at to see what's uh, comparable to the clients. The other huge en enhancements that they did here is they added a price per finished square foot column. So this is basically calculating the price per square foot of the sale value. So again, these are all the sales from 2022. So it took the sale price divided by the square footage of the house and gave us a number. It's already calculated there. We used to add this as a column in our um, searches. It's there. They also added this one at the other end. That's the value per square foot. And this is the, the assessed value divided by the square footage of the house. Again, it, it automatically puts it in there so that it's easy for us to be able to sort to try and find which ones are going to be a good argument for a lower value for our client. So now if you're doing a sale, um, if, if you're trying to compare the client's house to other to homes that sold last year, and of course the clients didn't sell last year, they're gonna you're gonna need to copy the value per square foot value into the price per finished square foot value so that when you sort, it'll come out somewhere in the middle and it'll look like this. And so, um, so again, you can see that there are a bunch of houses that sold last year that the price per square foot from the sale was less than what the county is saying that this client's house is valued at. And so you want to look at those to see, you know, hey, why, which of these would be a good argument for, um, for a lower value for our client? So basically you'll be looking at just the ones that are, you know, lower price per square foot than the client. So you, you don't have to go through all those ones that were a lot more. Um, I then sort of eyeball it to just try and get kind of things that are similar to the clients. So things like the square footage, the bathrooms, the year built, the condition, quality. Just you know, things that will sort of factor into what the value of the house would be. Try and look for ones that are kind of similar. Um, and you know, just sort of eyeball to figure out which ones are good, um, good comps. You can do the same thing with the value per square foot. You sort by that column. And again, you know, look for the ones that are lower than the clients. Um, this one is for sale, so it's not necessarily the same, but um, but it gives you that it, it makes it easy to um, to narrow down what it is you're going to be looking at. I will say for doing the value, you you can use the same spreadsheet using the value, but it, I recommend going back and doing another search and unclicking the sales in order to do the uniformity search because the um, you know, this only has homes that sold last year. And if the clients, have, you know, especially clients who have been in their homes for, for ages, it's going to be probably a lot more like some of the homes that have not sold in a long time. And so, you know, you want to be sure to, to go back and search using those. But it's the same same idea. Like you'll still sort by that column and, um, and then eyeball to see, you know, what seems like would be a good, you know, good comp. And I went through and I, I just kind of eyeballed and figured out, you know, which ones I thought might be good. Um, essentially, I reject any ones that have a zero um, or, you know, very low price per square foot because, you know, those are usually ones where it's just like family exchanging property or, you know, it's, it's not a real like arm's length transaction type sale. Um, so I kind of ignore those and then come and start with you know, kind of as low as I can get and see, you know, which ones I seem like they'd be arguable, you know, not too much bigger, kind of the same um, condition and quality, kind of the same bathrooms. And, you know, I some of them, it's got more bathrooms um, and, and bigger, you know, it, and they sold for less than what our clients' houses are raised for. That's, you know, those are comps that can be used to argue for a lower value. 
So now again, that's using the enhanced property search. You can also use the basic property search. Um, it'll take you to a different search method. Again, it's, it's kind of the same type of things that you're searching for. It's a lot, a lot more persnickety, but you can um, pull up the client's information or if you're looking at comps to try and see if these are ones that have been appealed. You know, if you're looking at the value, um, the uniformity, if it, to see if they've appealed, it actually does appear in this um, basic property search. It has all the same information that the um, the other one does. It has the notice of assessment. This, I, I didn't update this screenshot either. Um, it does have the 2023 assessments now. Um, and so, and, and just, you know, all like you have to click through the different categories, but, um, but it has all the same information that the enhanced property search has all in one line. Um, but the big difference is it also has this appeals and appeal history. So the appeals will be able to show whether or not appeal has been filed this year. And the appeals history will tell us whether or not there were appeals in the past. And so that can confirm if you see a, a value that's the same for more than one year, you can check here and, and see, you know, was it really an appeal or not? <clears throat> so you want to go through, when you first pull up the, the client's property, you want to go through and check to see if, if the client's property information is accurate. Think about the square footage, the quality of construction, the condition of the property, you know, damage, especially water or structural damage, can call for a, a lower condition code. Um, accessory buildings that, you know, if they have accessory buildings listed that the client doesn't have or like they've been torn down, that's, you know, something that changes the value. HVAC, the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, finished basement, things, you know, these are things that factor into what the value of the house should be. And if any of that's not accurate, then that's going to be a value appeal. Um, the other reason to go through the, the client's home is to, to gather the information that you need to compare it to others. Now, again, with the enhanced property search, all that information or most of that information is, is already in the chart. And so it makes it easier to find that information. But especially once you're trying to narrow down which ones you want to um, to pick for the comps, you want to know kind of what the client has versus what other houses have. A word about what is similar. So if the client's house is in a neighborhood where they're all identical, those are going to be similar. You know, the, that's a no brainer. The, you know, it's going to be very little deviation that will cause it to not be similar. And so it's pretty easy to compare the value they have for, for one to the value they have for another. But most houses are not like that. Most houses are in neighborhoods where there's very different things around them. Um, and so in those cases, you can't argue that those are exactly the same. Um, and in some cases, they're not at all similar. Um, and so the best way to argue that they are similar is to use that price per square foot. And that's why we tend to use that um, as sort of the stand-in for finding the comps that are similar um, but have a lower value. So this is sort of the miscellaneous um, thing, other things that the client might need to know. Um, and those last couple of things probably are, fall into that category too. Um, so a recap for, for clients, tax appeals are the place to argue to reduce the value. And by reducing the value, um, they reduce the taxable value, which then reduces the taxes on, especially on anything that's um, not subject to the floating exemptions. They do need to present some evidence for why the value should be lower. Now, the time to, to present that evidence is at the Board of Equalization. So if they present it now, that's fine, but they don't have to. The, the, they, they do need to be working towards having some evidence to be able to show to the Board of Equalization. The Board of Equalization is not scary. It's just three taxpayers like they are, so they shouldn't be afraid to be going to it. It's not a real formal hearing, it, you know, and worst case scenario, it, they end up with the value that they would have if they didn't appeal and they get that frozen for the next two years. So, you know, there are still advantages, three-year freeze. Um, and then they need to understand that the deadline is July 24th. 
again, just quick recap, the uniformity research is looking at uh, the appraiser's values for the current year. Um, it's sort of like looking for Easter eggs. You, you never know when you're gonna find one, but occasionally you got some that are just oddly low and it's wonderful. Value research is gonna be looking at sales for the prior year. Um, so again, uniformity, you're looking at the assessments for 2023. Value, you're looking at sales for 2022. Sales validity. Um, so you'll see where it says a uh, sale is valid or uh, qualified or unqualified or invalid. Um, and basically qualified or valid sales are arm's length transactions between a knowledgeable buyer and a knowledgeable seller. Sometimes these unqualified ones should be qualified. You know, sometimes they're not really, um, you know, they're saying that it's not qualified because it's related entities, but, but a lot of times it's not, it's, you know, it's just that they have two companies, like, you know, that, or that it's been remodeled after sale. That's not a reason to disqualify it as a comp for the, um, you know, the client's home, because the client's home probably is one that would need to be remodeled after sale. So that sale price is probably pretty accurate. Um, so, you know, you can still use the, the invalid or unqualified sales, but you need to be careful. It's better to use the valid or qualified sales if possible. And you can find the, whether it's a valid or qualified sale in the, um, you know, in the property information. Additional appeal evidence that they can provide are like recent appraisals, you know, if it's for a lower value. Uh, photographs, photographs are great, especially for property conditions that are not visible from the street. You know, it supports what the client's saying about, like, you know, what the condition of their home is. The Board of Equalization people eat those up. Um, repair estimates are very helpful for saying, you know, listen, in order for me to sell my home for this, I would have to pay this much money. So I'm, you know, a buyer would deduct that from the sale. Um, and then also Google Street View and internet searches can be helpful to, um, to get information about, you know, other properties around. Some words of warning, beware of the frozen values, avoid uninhabitable um, properties unless your property is uninhabitable. Try to use the valid or qualified sales. Um, affordability is not grounds for lowering the value. And this is one of those things that the clients really need to understand. A lot of times they're going in because they can't afford the taxes. And uh, while I totally understand that and feel it, it's not something the Board of Equalization can do anything about. What they can do something about is if you go in and say, I can't afford my taxes and they shouldn't be this high because my house has these conditions. You need to give some sort of reason for the Board of Equalization to be able to lower the, the tax. Uh, to be able to lower the value, which will then lower the taxable value. The appraiser is going to be having their own little um, you know, scary looking spreadsheets. So um, it's important to, um, you know, for the client to have their own version of that. And that's where that enhanced um, property search you know, generating a document that can be really helpful because it will means that any pro se client can go in and, you know, have, you know, a professional looking packet to be able to take with them. So that's my presentation. What are the questions? The only one that's outlying on the chat, which I wasn't um, sure how to explain over like text, um, was what you meant by January 1st as the date of the ownership of the property interest or the ownership interest in the property. Yeah, so um, for the purposes of Homestead exemptions, the they basically have to qualify for the Homestead exemption as of January 1st. And so that's where that ownership interest comes into play. So somebody who bought the home on January 2nd can't get the Homestead exemption until next year. Um, but if they, you know, bought it on December 31st, they can get the Hempstead exemption. And if they apply for it by April 3rd, they should appeal that if they didn't get it. Does that help? That does help. So the deadline to apply for Homestead exemption is April 1st. You can begin applying on January 1st. When can you be begin applying? You can begin applying anytime. Um, 
they they prefer that you wait until after April 1st of the the year that you're not getting it because they're swamped with trying to process the ones for the current year. But you could go in on you know April 2nd and apply for next year. Um, okay, so people can now apply for next year. Right, right. For 2024. Right. Okay, thank you. And then I have one last question. In terms of seniors and not paying property taxes, you said something at the beginning of um, 75,000. Yeah, so this is my mantra. Um, a lot of people come in thinking, oh, I'm a senior, I don't have to pay school taxes. And that's not true. Um, some counties do a better job of, or some taxing jurisdictions do a better job than others of trying to exempt the seniors, especially low income seniors. Um, where I see the biggest problem for seniors is city of Atlanta schools. And the reason is that the highest senior exemption, the, you know, the highest, the senior who's low income, the highest exemption they're gonna get is 75,000. So that means that if their home is worth $187,500, I think that's right, um, then they're gonna be paying, or 501, they're gonna be paying school taxes. Because once they cross over that $75,000 exemption, there's paying school taxes. And so as the value goes up, they get hit with higher and higher school taxes. Um, there are, there's a floating exemption, which um, means that the amount the taxes can go up is limited. And um, so the, the ones that have the floating exemption, the highest that it can go up from year to year is 3%. So even if the home value skyrockets, the taxable value is only gonna go up 3%. Um, but that doesn't apply to all parts of the tax bill. It does not apply to the Atlanta city school taxes. So, okay. um, but, but the floating, the floating exemption applies to seniors only. And at what age is that? Okay. No, the, the, the floating exemption is, um, at least again, not all jurisdictions are the same, um, and not all pieces of the tax bill are the same, but for the most part, that that's a basic exemption in Fulton and city of Atlanta. Um, and so as soon as you get the Hempstead exemption, you, you lock in that floating exemption for the categories it covers. It doesn't tend to cover schools or bonds um, for a lot, of, a lot of the categories. Okay, and one last question. Senior tax exemption begins at 62, correct? Right. Um, you, you can get the senior exemptions at a younger age if you're disabled. Thank you. And there are different exemptions that there's a, some that come in at 62, some that come in at 65, and then the last one comes in at 70. Um, and if you are interested in helping us get the word out on those exemptions, we always did a, do a big push at the beginning of the year. It's the same community partners. Um, and we, we do similar types of consultations to help people apply for their homestead exemptions too. So to be clear, I'm sorry, to be clear, so Fulton County and city of Atlanta has 80 year olds paying school taxes, to be clear. Yes, they have 90, 98 year olds paying school taxes, yes. Um, and just another plug on the, if you wanna help with the homestead exemption piece of things, um, another part of what we do is try and get the word out that legacy homeowners may be able to get the exemptions before they get a deed in their name. You know, usually they go into the tax office and they're told, no, you, you have to have a deed in your name. And that there, there's some provisions of the law that allows for people to get it before then. Um, and so we're trying to, to make sure people know that and try and enforce those rights, which is again, why if, if someone didn't get the homestead exemption they applied for and they should have, they need to appeal it. Okay, any other questions or comments or needs, concerns? Okay, awesome. Well, so I, thank you. Oh, let, let me just do, real quick, just a real quick recap that, again, most of what y'all will be doing is just going through the online uh, appeal form. 
and helping people with doing that, you'll have some free research that'll make it a lot easier um, to, to do it. But I just wanted to give you the background so that when you had questions about it, hopefully you can answer them. But any questions that you get that you don't know the answer to, we will be there. We will be you know, available to be able to come over and answer those questions. And also, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. So um, if I'm scheduled to help on the virtual training, I believe it's Saturday, it's, I'll get a link sent out sometime this week regarding the virtual training? Yes. Okay. Um, for the Saturday consultations, we our consultations will open up for them to start um, registering um, tonight and on Wednesday as well. So once they start getting registered, we'll send you guys out um, a little bit before that, how to get connected. And then once you come on, we'll have you guys go into like breakout rooms and be able to uh, do your one-on-one -on -one consultations from there. Great. Sounds good. Thanks for this uh, stellar presentation, Stacey. Sure. Thank you. And thank you for paying it forward. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and there was one more question. Do wheelchair bound seniors have to go to the Board of Equalization meeting? Um, there are two options, I believe, Stacey, if I'm correct, because you can do a, you can do a virtual option. Um, if you have someone, of course, to be with you or represent you at that meeting, and then you can also go in but those are the two options that i know of well there's and, there's sorry so i was just gonna say um there's also the and this might be what stacy was gonna say um one of the things that we've anecdotally noticed is that if we go to the hearings like when we're representing people or or whatever when we go to the hearings with them and they have a obvious disability or something like that um they are more likely to to get more sympathy from the board of equalization from those three fulton residents um, and we just seem to have more success in those cases. So I would still probably tell them, hey, if you can do it, if you can get somebody to take you, if you can get your way there, you're more likely to have a better outcome. But if they actually cannot come um, and, and cannot do the, the Zoom option, they can send somebody down there for them. They, you know, and it doesn't have to be a lawyer, doesn't even have to be anyone other than, you know, someone that they trust to tell the Board of Equalization what they think. Um, it, they just need a letter of authorization to confirm that they're authorized to be there on behalf of that person. Um, and Atlanta Legal Aid does have, we do have a, an ongoing project where we try and, and place people with volunteers if they need, need help with the hearings. That it, you know, it's really a case by case basis. Anything okay, else? Awesome. So, thanks again, guys, for coming, for volunteering, um, you know, for taking the training for today. Um, we also will have uh, an information session where we let our participants. Um, know how to do the process. So we kind of go over this uh, information again on Wednesday. Um, it will be at Paradise Baptist Church. It would also be via Zoom. Um, so I will send that out to you guys as well. Should you guys want to just kind of come get a second dose, or if you want to pass the information along to um, your friends, your family, your coworkers, things of that nature, um, so that you guys can keep up with what we're doing and the schedule in which we're working. Um, outside of that, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email myself, John Luke. Um, you can reply to the email that you got for earlier today. Of course, you guys are very welcome for uh, the organization and the training and everything. We're just really happy to be able to, to do this for the community, to get a lot of the word out that this is possible and help people to really reduce the financial uh, burdens of, of home ownership. We want to encourage it and not, you know, discourage it or, or leave people out to die. So again, if you have questions, let us know. If you have any feedback or comments on how we can make the information more digestible or, you know, the timing or anything like that, again, please make sure that you email me. My email is marian, M-A-R-I-A-N at A-T-L-B-L-P dot O-R-G. I'm putting that down in the chat. But again, you can also message John Luke and he can get it to me as well. So um, without that, we'll 
I'm just gonna, you know, wrap up and say thank you. And if you guys wanna visit us on Wednesday, please do so. And we're gonna hang out, I guess, for a few more minutes just to see if anybody needs anything. But outside of that, thanks for showing up and you guys are more than welcome to either hang out with us for a second or log off. Yeah, and actually somebody just asked a question. I was gonna say this. We are gonna send out a copy of the presentation, uh, the, the slides, as well as a link for the video to people who signed up. So we'll and we'll also have some paper copies available as well um, on the actual consultation day. So you'll have things that you can kind of follow along with as you're doing your sessions with the participants.